Hi, this is David Cantu, the founder and CEO of the Coaster Challenge Network and the executive producer of the Coaster Challenge Podcast. On behalf of the entire Coaster Challenge Podcast team, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you out there for your love and support these past two seasons. From our family to yours, we would want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is, the most listened to radio show on the planet even the other stations are tuned in to. Hi, this is Don Helbig, area manager of digital marketing from Kings Island, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Hi, this is Gabby Gomez, and you are listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Hi, this is Jake Toko with Rocky Mountain Construction, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Hi, this is Leah Cook Bloomhart from Holiday World and Splash of Safari, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Do you accept the coaster challenge? Yes, I accept the coaster challenge. Do you accept the coaster challenge? Mm-hmm. Coaster challenge podcast is here. It's time to face your fears. Get that theme park therapy and let us both your Coaster fears. challenge podcast is here. Your fear can disappear. We know that theme park therapy can drive all your tears. Do you accept the coaster challenge? Yes, I accept the coaster challenge. Do you accept the coaster challenge? We accept because you know we're not average. You're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. A journey where people become fearful to fearless, all from riding roller coasters. So please secure your hats and glasses and keep your hands and arms inside the podcast. It's time to accept the Coaster Challenge with your host, Andrew Locke. Hi, everyone. This is Andrew, one of the executive producers of the Coaster Challenge podcast. Got a special guest here joining us today. For coaster enthusiasts, the joy of the parks and coasters goes well beyond actual visits to the parks. Enthusiasts worldwide love to purchase and collect mementos and memorabilia to decorate the walls, shelves, and counters. Putting their favorite parks and coasters on display is a big part of the passion, certainly is for me. One of the most popular companies that makes such mementos is known for their wooden coaster cutouts, working models, and yes, their nano coasters. The Coaster Challenge podcast is proud to welcome from Coaster Dynamics and Print My Ride Detroit, Matt. Welcome to the podcast, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. We are proud to have you. And uh, as a fan of Coaster Dynamics, as someone who's bought many of their products and uh, loves that whole side of, again, the collection and, and memento side of, uh, of uh, being a Thuzi, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, the work that you do. And we'll, we'll be getting into that in the second half of the interview. But the first half, we'll be talking more about you as a person and as a coaster enthusiast yourself. But before we even get to that, um, why don't you just tell our audience about yourself, um, your love of parks and coasters, and just briefly describe the work that you do in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, my name is Matt Schmatzer. I created the uh, Print My Ride identity um, to kind of showcase the the work I do. Um, I guess going all the way back, I, I, I've always been in, into roller coasters as long as I was tall enough. Um, my parents um, would always take us to Cedar Point every summer. So I'm obviously from Detroit and Cedar Point's about two hour drive um, from us. So we would go down there every summer, Cedar Point every year. But then my parents would also take us to Kings Island maybe like every other year because that's a little bit further of a drive, but we still loved going there. And um, like I, I've i just always been into the theme park world. I always loved it. Um, I uh, wasn't really into roller coasters like since like I was really little. I think like my parents had to drag me on the Iron Dragon. And I loved it. And then they had to drag me on the Gemini when I was tall enough. And I was like, I don't really want to go. It's kind of tall. And like, I still was like kind of nervous. But once they got me on, I'm like, oh, I was like hooked. So um, that that's just been great. So that it, like my history goes like all the way back since like all the way back to when you can't or when I couldn't remember if that makes sense. Um, it was sure, just like always, always a part of my life. And I think um, it was the first, I think it, it wasn't the year 2000 when Millennium Force opened, but it was the, the year after I finally got to go ride it. And I wasn't really even hardcore into it. I was like, I think 11. Yeah, that sounds right. And um, I went on with my dad and his brother. So it was my dad and my uncle, and we, we wrote it. And that's when like the, the switch was flicked. I'm like, dude, roller coasters are awesome. This ride is the bee's knees. I, and like, and this is like, 
when I, when that was all happening for me, I didn't even really think about like all the six flags parks, like universal Disneyland. I was just like, dude, I don't even care. Like this place is the best. And that was like before, like really, um, you know, all the, like, I, I, I was too young to know like how to go to forums or whatever. Like, I, I made that conclusion in my mind without, you know, sharing it with like other people. And I was like, this is amazing. So that was like the moment in time I was like, I want to, I want to be the guy that designs these. I want to be working, you know, doing the engineering and design work on roller coasters. And I used that to fuel, you know, me getting an engineering degree and then try to find my way into the industry, which it's hilarious um, when you're when you're graduating and everyone says, oh, you're looking for an entry level job, but we need like five years experience or you need to like have an internship or did you work at a park? Or there's like a million reasons why I'm not allowed to design roller coasters. And I, I was like, this is crazy. Like, how do I, you know, set myself up, you know, to get into, you know, the industry and, and when I was graduating um, back in like the two thousands, it there wasn't like those theme park groups. There wasn't like the type of networking that there is now, which I get so pumped up to even be, you know, a part of or just talk to some of the students because I think what they're doing is great and um, they're finding ways to, you know, get their foot in the door where I didn't have that opportunity. So um, I I never lost my passion for the amusement park industry, the roller coasters. And I would, you know, I'd be like any other person playing with, you know, video games, um, connects roller coasters. I was the fan when Coaster Dynamics started doing the Scorpion and Dragon models. And I was like, this yes. is the best thing ever. I can't afford it <laughs> because I was like <laughs> in school and I was a kid. Like, it's so weird to be like, it's weird how long they've been around and how things have changed in the sense of, you know, what they do as a company. And, and then like, I would have told, like, if you were to ask me 10 years ago, it's like, would you work at Coaster and I was like, no, why, why would I like, I, <laughs> I have no connection there. So it, it's crazy to see how that works. So, and, and I guess to tie this all in right now, what I do is I design um, roller coaster merchandise based off of the ride vehicles for roller coasters. And that kind of, there's a, there's a really long and interesting story of how that came to be. Um, but essentially I wanted to find a way, a cheap way to honor people's favorite rides and have like a memento or, you know, something that they could take away from like this ride that would represent, um, you know, a portion of it and coaster dynamics already had nano coasters out and i'm like oh they have the layout but they don't have the, the actual ride vehicle so right. how would you do that and i was 3d printing large scale models of these ride vehicles and everyone said i want it how much and i was like honestly if you really want it like i would probably say like 800 dollars and then everyone would be like, that's so greedy. How could you charge so much? I'm like, well, <laughs> there's materials, there's design time, there's assembly, there's all the fasteners. Like I put a lot of details into these. Right, and right. Every, like they wouldn't understand. And I was like, that's the price. Like, I'm sorry. And then that's kind of, you know, every invention is solving a problem. So that's where, and also uh, most inventions are just taking two things that pre-exist and then combining it to make something new. And that's what I did. I found a cheap way to make a ride vehicle and, that's how coaster cutouts came to be and I uh, got hooked up with coaster dynamics along the way. But I think that's a quicker brief overview. <laughs> I forgot. No, that's great. You it, just it, wanted it, an overview. <laughs> oh no, that's great. And I, and I you know, I, we, I've interviewed a lot of people here on this podcast and it, they've always had a great conversation. Uh, some people are more passionate than others and just that's how they are in life just in general. Uh, and I, I can tell how passionate you are. And I, I love it because I'm a passionate person too. I'm driven by passion. So I can tell we're going to have a fun conversation. And that's a great initial overview. We're going to dive a lot more into both you, your passion for coasters, uh, as well as your passion for engineering and design. And, and, and again, getting into the work that you're doing now with Print My Ride and Coaster Dynamics. Um, again, I love that stuff too. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking about it. So we'll get into the details. But thanks for the overview for now. I appreciate that. Awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> of course. Of course. Now I want, I want to ask you a question that's not, it's, it's tangentially related to what we're talking about because of where you live. So are you a haunt fan as well as being a coaster and parks fan? Like in the Halloween in park, ha like haunts, Halloween's mazes. I, I am. My wife's not. I mean, uh, <laughs> I would say, uh probably not uh, i'd be into it it's just like one of those things that i never got to like go and do like i've been to hall of weekends i've been to um 
Uh, there's a place that I don't know if they're around still, but there's like Erebus. It's like a haunted house. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. That place yeah. is awesome. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, because I have not ever been to Detroit before. I'm a huge haunt fan. Oh, I've got uh, some friends it's... that work in the industry. They cover it there. They uh, do a professional production, a company called Escape Visuals, um, a Christian and Morgan Duffy. They're good friends of mine and they're big haunt fans like me. And they have actually done documentaries about haunt, about haunts and they cover the haunts and, and do production with their company for haunt companies as amongst other companies. And they've shown me stuff all from all of the US that I've not been to yet. I've been to a lot of haunts, but as many I've not been to. And when they showed me Erebus and that what four story building I'm like, I think I need to get to Detroit. So if you living there, I don't talk to a lot of people that live in Detroit. So I was curious who've been, so you've been to Ere- Erebus and you're really um, impressed by it. Oh yeah. So first thing is Detroit is not as scary as people say it is. It's awesome. Actually, you can <laughs> see it from my house. I, I like, and uh, the second thing is, yeah, Erebus is in Pontiac, which I'd say is a little more scary than Detroit, <laughs> which is great location <laughs> for that. But um I loved it. It was awesome. Like my wife wasn't really too thrilled about it, but I was like, this is so cool. And like, they find all the loopholes. Like you're not like the, the, the ha- was it the haunter? Can't really touch the haunty or like, there's like all these right. rules that I'm not sure. Of. Oh, like, okay, well we'll just throw in an objects at people. We'll just like, they, they find all the loopholes. Like, Oh, well, a person didn't touch you, but this like actual, like doll looking thing is launched at you and like oh, lands yeah. on it. Like, yeah. and then there's like these robotic fists and it's like what did, what did i get myself into i loved it i thought it was awesome and yeah they're very they did, they did a lot of cool things with visual effects and and stuff that like well it also sucked to go with me because everyone's just like freaking out i'm like now how did they do this how was right. this made like right. i'm trying to dissect and reverse engineer what they're doing and that's that was me the whole time yeah <laughs> being it, being an engineer like I'm always trying to figure out how, how, how things work all the time, like theme park attractions and things, you know, other things. But uh, from what I've seen of Erebus, they are very impressive in terms of how they use technology and the latest and greatest. And I even have seen how a haunt I've been to where they will take what Erebus has done and, and implement it in, in a larger, like a theme park haunt or a larger independent haunt. So yeah, and yeah anyways, I got to get to one of these days, but that's, you that's do. again, it's tangential. Is. Yeah, no, thank you. I was curious if you, what your opinion was. That's good to hear you have a good opinion. So in any case, let's go ahead. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about theme parks and coasters. So um, tell me, and actually, I think you might've already answered this. Was Iron Dragon the first coaster you ever rode? Yeah. Yeah, Iron Dragon, because okay. I think like once I was tall enough, my parents were like, you got to go. And I was like, okay. And uh, I went on it. That's the only one that like, there may have been another one, which would probably be like the Wildcat or the Beastie, because I already oh, know shit. like those are the parks that we went to. But Iron Dragon was like the first one that I remember. I was like, that's a roller coaster. I went on it and I loved it. And Okay, because that's one of the first questions we started yep. off with. Kind of, kind of like an easy question, this first question you wrote. So got it. Okay, very good. Now... I may also, based on what your intro was, have sensed the answer to the next question, which is kind of the big part of our fear journey that I described to you before we started recording. So it sounds like after riding Millennium Force, you had went through this shift in your head, which we, we all seem to go through as part of this journey. So would you say, and if it's not, then that's fine, but would you say that Millennium Force is the coaster that in, intimidated you and scared you the most in your life or was it something else? Um, I, I don't think so. I would actually say the Gemini, which is really weird. And I think it was because I was okay. younger too. Like I think right. it was like, and like, these are like single digit years. Like I was like eight or nine or, or, or 10 even. And I was just like, and I wasn't even sure. Like I was like so young. I didn't even know what I was talking about. I was like, I don't want to go on that. Like, no. And my parents were like, Oh, it's not so bad. Blah, blah, blah. You're, you're going to be fine. And I was like, no i'm good and then like i wouldn't really ride too many and then i don't know i think it was either my brother or my parents were like no you're, you're gonna ride it like we come here every year and we're not gonna deal with this crap <laughs> so so i did and and uh, you know what's funny is even after i wrote it i was just like eh, like like i'm i'm not feeling it and then uh, i think like the the switch moment was when I rode Millennium Force. Like I saw these commercials and like this is the tallest thing and blah 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 and like broke all these records and it's like super cool and smooth and it's not like jerky and I was like all right and then and I rode it and I was like what the heck is going on like this is this is the cat's meow right here this is what this is what like I don't know I couldn't even tell you like what like flipped the switch I just remember getting off of it and I was like 
I want to make something like this. Like I want to go and do this. And I was like, what, 11 at the time. So, um, right. So there was a transition. I couldn't pinpoint it to one moment other than like, I think I got probably over the fear at that point. And then I probably became interested in roller coasters at that point as well. So that's why I have a sentimental tie to Millennium Force because it's like my favorite ride and okay. sentimental reasons. And I'm sure everyone else has a favorite ride for other personal reasons. And that's like the right. cool thing. Oh, 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 we'll get to favorites later. Yeah. That, yeah. The favorite, favorite <laughs> oh, sorry. Honestly, I mean, they, they can be related, but oftentimes actually aren't. And again, there's nothing wrong if it is for you. It just, a lot of people it isn't, but we'll get to that. But before we get to that, I, I, I want to, maybe it's just me. Maybe everyone listening right now, they're like, Andrew, everything's good. We totally get it. I'm a little confused right now. So help me break this down. Okay? Yes. So Gemini wrote first, obviously. So first of all, what intimidated you about Gemini? Was it the height? I don't know. I like, and I can't remember. I think it was just probably like the height, um, not knowing what it did. And like, I, I still have like that stomach feeling where it's like leaving you. Like, I don't have that anymore, but I was just like, okay. I, don't know. I think it was just, it just felt too big at the time. And I was like, maybe next right. year. I, okay. I can't remember why actually there was like okay. it was just some like no I don't want to do it I'm not interested I was probably okay, scared that, that's for all right. multiple reasons couldn't tell you which one um, okay <laughs> maybe all right well else. well well the uh, you know hindsight is always twenty twenty to say the hindsight we already know you wrote it so you went in and I wrote did. it yeah um, kind of got kind of got pushed into it which is very common theme we've seen with people with their early coasters, the ones that scared them the most, the peer pressure happened with me, you know, as well, years ago back at Great Adventure. But, okay, so you wrote it. So talk to me, how did you feel after you got off of it? You kind of mentioned that you were kind of wishy-washy. You weren't like excited, like, you know, what were you feeling? Yeah, like, it's so weird because, um, yeah, I was just like, yeah, it was good, but it wasn't like great, but it wasn't, it was like, I, I don't know. Like, I think I was like also indifferent, but I was like, hey, at least I wrote it. Now I can, you know, cross that one off the list. And um, okay. Uh, so are you telling there. me, okay. Are you telling me that, you know, you've, well, first of all, how old were you when you watched Gemini? Uh, whenever I got over, was it 48 inches? So like, is that four feet? Like it was like, I was like eight, nine, maybe seven, like, like right there, like I just hit the height thing and we're, we're like, okay. we're going. So like, um, how tall is that? Is that four feet? Uh, four feet 30, yeah, yeah. But also I'm like six, four. So I was like tall for my age anyways. So I must've been oh, like wow. younger too. Okay. So, okay. um, it's, yeah, I don't know. I, and like, that's everything too is like, I was so young. I just remember I didn't want to go. My parents gave me crap about it. They still gave me crap about it. And even after I got off, I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if this is for me. And I just like went around. I was like, we'll be back here next year. And then like a few years later, like, I think actually, right. if I'm going to kind of cut forward a bit, I think I was like, I want to go around Millennium Force because it's got cool station music. Um, and I might that have changed. Does, like, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I, could, I feel so bad, but I can't remember. I, I got off of it. I got off the Gemini and I was just like, eh, I'm indifferent. Okay. Okay. And, so and are you telling... Not- I'm oh, sorry. Okay, let, 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 okay, are you telling me that you know? Okay, Grant was a few years in between, but you know, Gemini it was intimidating to you because of the size of it and the height, just the size of the coaster, and you wrote it and you're indifferent or whatever. But after doing that, Millennium Force is much taller, much bigger. Oh yeah. So Millennium Force did not have that level of intimidation for you. I was like a little scared. I was like, I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm like, I'm not gonna die though. I don't think like. Everyone else that goes. Are you, on were you not off. as scared? Were you not <laughs> as scared as you were with Gemini before riding Correct. Gemini? Oh no, I was like okay. amped up, ready to go. I was like, dude, this is this looks awesome. Like, I think it was just the way it was marketed too. Like, I saw the commercials. Like, there was like cool right. music. It was the future. Um, the Gemini is like my parents went on this when they were in college. Like, this thing is old and not uh, cool uh, uh, and and uh, okay. But but the marketing, that's kind of the before the ride. That's like maybe what's motivating you to get on the ride or not. Yeah. And we already know from what you said earlier that, you know, okay, if you got off of Gemini, you're like, meh. But then after you got off of Money and Force, you were like, bring it on. You like it, it clicked oh, in yeah. your head. You want more. So was it I'm gonna make a I have a theory here. Is you you conquered your fear with Gemini and you just the ride experience was nothing exciting. Because you conquered your fear with Gemini, you were able to get a Millennium Force. You were a little scared, but it was not a big deal because you 
we already conquer your fear, but the quality of the experience and the, the more extensive height and, you know, the experience that overall with land force was much higher. So that's what really got you into coasters because you finally wrote a coaster that excited you. Is that kind yeah, of? Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I'll, do, okay. I'll align with that. That makes sense. Okay. That's interesting. It's not common. And that's why we like talking to different people. <laughs> Usually when you, whoever, you know, whoever may be, the coaster that they break their fears on, it also is basically what turns them into an enthusiast. Maybe not like full on coaster credit counting and traveling all over, but it gets them into coasters. Mm -hmm. For you, you broke your fear. The coaster itself, I get it, Gemini's older, it's an older arrow. You know, it just didn't wow you. And it just took a little bit of a time in there for you then to get on a much bigger coaster, newer, brand new, you know, in the case of Money Force for you. And that's what really got you excited about coasters. And that, that totally is understandable. Um, it's kind of unique, uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. So everyone's no. different. So, I'm, a, I'm yeah. a total weirdo. So I totally get it. it <laughs> it's also, it also didn't help that we were there every year. And sometimes right. we would go two or three times. So it was like, like I, I would have more fun. I would go ride the Troika a million times before I'd be like, let's go ride the Gemini. Like when I was a kid, I mean, or right. there's, there was other like smaller rides there that I like loved. There's other rides there that I also hated uh, for other reasons. <laughs> um, right. But uh, yeah. So like, it, it really wasn't like, um, like for me to ride and be like, Oh, I conquered my fear. It was just kind of like, Oh, I did that and I didn't die. So I guess this is okay. <laughs> like, Got and then the, the next it. year we would go and like, I don't know, like, I just, that's just what happened. That's just how I am. But it got, got me it. amped up to go ride Mullion Force. So that it must have worked. <laughs> right, right. Now, like, if you could imagine if you hadn't conquered your fears on Gemini, if you had kind of remained steadfast and told your parents, your brother, no, I'm not riding it, no interest. I'll wait for you guys. You guys go ahead. Would, perhaps you would not have gotten on money and force or at least not that early on in life. Yeah. At least not that early on. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you could, for the next couple of questions, if you could look at you conquering your fears on Gemini, maybe not getting excited about coasters, but looking at the watershed from that, from going to money and force and beyond. Okay. Look at it from that perspective. So how did conquering your fears on Gemini and going beyond that, how did that impact your life? I mean, I guess the one thing I guess that I would say I could take away as far as conquering your fear and, and moving on your life is just, I just learned to be, be like, not say no, just like, all right. If, or like, if people are like, Hey, you should do this. Or like, you know, if they have confidence, you'll be able to succeed or whatever, just be like, all right, if they can try, if they trust me to survive through this, then I can do it. So I don't turn away from any situation. Now I just say like, opportunities presented i just go for it and no matter what happens just try to write it out and do the best you can got it so basically you identify that conquering your fears like you did with gemini basically allowed you to be as they would say open-minded about you know yes. opportunities or you know you basically were not anxiety was not preventing you from doing things moving forward yes Okay, there, will, there will always be anxiety with anything you do. You just don't, you just ignore it. It's gonna, right. It's anxiety. Gonna yeah. Anxiety. It doesn't go away, No. but it, you're able to hold it in check. So it doesn't stop you. You kind of, it, it just, it exists at a lower level uh, mm -hmm. for basically, and that's how it is for me. And that's how it, other people described it where, you know, they just don't let it stop them. It's not as inhibiting. So that, and that's great that it's the case for you as well. So if we take a step back from, you know, the fear itself and anxiety, but just in general, you know, looking at where your life is now and everything that's happened before, before this, how have coasters and theme parks had a, a significant positive impact on your life in what are those ways? <laughs> Ah, uh, there's a million. Uh, you said positive, right? It broke up. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. like your top couple. I mean, obviously oh, you work. Man. You work in, you know, you're making a living off of it. That's that's an easy, low hanging fruit one. But well, you know, what else? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it's just uh, I don't even know where to start. Like, um, positive. Like, ever since that moment, riding Million Force, I was like, I want to design roller coasters, and then everything that I kept doing was there was always a uh, an angle like. I want to do this because I could somehow use this 
skill, talent, knowledge, learning towards, you know, roller coaster design, engineering, blah, 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 et cetera. So like they've always had a positive impact on my life because it, it, it is kind of interesting because I kind of, um, you know, it, it, it's funny is what I want to say. And it might not be funny to you guys, but I think it's funny where all I ever wanted to do is design roller coasters. And when I was trying my hardest, when the passion was the highest level, when I was memorizing all the things, when I was going, trying to research anything I could, I was looking at how every other coaster engineer designer got their foot in the industry. I couldn't. And, um, I went on to go professionally work in the automotive industry. And I actually, I, I, I do still work in the automotive, automotive, automotive industry. I have two jobs. I, I, I do automotive design okay. by day and then by night I'm doing coaster dynamic stuff. And it's, it's funny to me that I, I probably had more passion at the beginning than I do now. Uh, now I'm more of a realist or, or, or you know, I, I understand right. you know, the capabilities of what I can, what I'm, uh, capable of and where my limits are where before I was like, I can do anything. Um, now I'm right. a little more practical. I'm like, I can't do anything, but, but, um, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, like I applied to a bunch of places. I asked, how do I get a job? I, uh, sent my resume and like, you just like, nah. So then I, I just started doing my own thing. And then next thing you know, like, I think like now you hear from everyone. They're like, Oh, you're interested. You want to work here? And you're like, but where were you guys like 10 years ago? Like I'm, right. I'm settled now. I, I can't go and, uh, uh, you know, drop what I'm doing. And like, the other thing, it's like, I'm married. I have a house. I don't want to leave. Like I said, I like Detroit. It's really nice. Um, and it's like, I can't, I can't just drop what I'm doing. And, um, it, it kind of, it kind of sucked really because I really wanted to do that and I couldn't. And through, you know, following my passion through roller coasters, I never stopped. Like I was, I was still determined. I was like, I love this, this stuff. Like, I'm not going to stop right. what I'm doing. And, and when I say what I was doing is I was, you know, making models and I was, you know, playing like no limits and roller right. coaster tycoon and doing all that stuff. And as I matured and got older, I'd be doing more sophisticated things. Like I got into 3d printers because as an engineer, I think it's amazing that I can take something from the digital world and bring it into the physical world without yeah. shipping it to a supplier to go, you know, charge thousands of dollars to make it. Like I can make it at home in plastic for like, you know, cents or dollars. And that blew my mind. So the first thing I did was 3D printed some, you know, B&M track. And I was like, look at this, it's adorable. And then it sat, I still have it. I, and it came off the first printer I owned, which um, was a MakerBot. And um, it's still sitting upstairs. And then I was just like, what if I could, you know, 3D print more? And I started 3D printing more track. And then next thing I know, I was like, what was if I could put a car around it and make it work? <laughs> and then after two years of playing around with that, like I did, and then like, and then I just kept going and, and growing that and posting it online and getting noticed and, and then just kind of built a portfolio for myself because I was following other people. Like obviously Mike Graham, he started Coast Mix, but also to get into, you know, I think it was CCI and gravity group. Like he was doing uh, like the black plague is one of his, you know, famous working models. And then there was, um, I think it's, his name is Chris Brewer. Like he had some awesome ones and he had a, he had a website that he showed how he did it. And that's right. where I took a lot of my, um, I guess I, or I went there a lot and checked it out just to see what he was doing. And he would like make molds for the cross ties. And I was like, that's amazing. I want to do that. And then there was a, there's a few others too. Like Chris Gray makes awesome models too. His are, his are static, but they're, they're pieces of just like beautiful art. And right. these guys all did models and they found a way to get in the industry. And I was like, I could do the same, but I also was smart enough to think that I need to put my own little twist to it. And that's where the 3d printing came in. Cause it's kind of, it was new at the time, or I, I mean, it's up and coming, all the patents opened up and now everyone has a 3d printer. So right. I was trying right. to lever leverage that. And, um, so the point of all of this, going back to your original question, like coaches yeah. have always been a part of my life and it will always forever will be at this point. Um, but the, like they've, it's always opened up new opportunities, new doors. I always get to meet new people, try new things and really test and actually get to my limits of my capability. And once I learned what those limits were, I could then, you know, gauge, you know, what I can take on and what I can't take on and, uh, right. you know, just learn, learned a lot about myself. 
Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So a few things to unpack there. So, you know, basically the, the overall, what you're saying is that, you know, your interest in passion for coasters kind of helped guide your career, not in the way you were originally thinking or hoping, but in a way that's very much satisfied you being part of the maker community and getting involved coaster dynamics and okay, which Absolutely. we'll talk more about later. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Got it. Got it. So um, by the way, um, so, and I find this, so the union of coaster enthusiasts and car enthusiasts, the, the, it's the decent size. It's not, they're not hundred percent, definitely not hundred percent, but there's a decent size. And, and what's interesting is that I am a car enthusiast. That's another one of my passions. So oh, I, awesome. I just want to ask you a quick question. I'm not going to ask you who you work for because, you know, you know, we don't ask that kind of thing you know, on the podcast, but do, do you work for being in Detroit? Do you work for one of the traditional American manufacturers put it that way? Yeah. Or and like a, a contractor? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. 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 Um, okay. Got it. Got it. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm an open okay. book. I don't think it really matters, but I, I do work at General Motors. If that, like, General Motors. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Nice. Yeah. I've got, I have another friend who also is rolling into coasters and he works for GM as well. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, he's, uh, he works in the uh, plant level, I think. Actually in uh, in Missouri at a plant in Missouri, not not in Detroit, okay. but yeah. But in any case, but uh, yeah, no, very cool. Again, I love cars and um, and uh, you know, obviously coasters. So it's kind of cool, and, and I find this all the time. Um, so you the the lesson you learned is an important one. So I want to ex explain the clarity here and and why I want to point out this. So. Some of our audience, some of the people I connect with at times, they are on the younger side of things. They're in their late teens. Mm -hmm. um, we've had guests on the show, and even in their mid-teens, and you know whatnot. And and these are these are kids. They're you know young adults that they are at a critical point in their life because they're going to be figuring out what their career is or what they think it's going to be or what they want to study in school and whatnot. And so I I get um, requests periodically. Uh, when I, you know, people on Instagram contact me and, and whatnot, and they know, I'm, you know, from the podcast and they ask me, Andrew, you know, I know you've been all over the world and traveling, you know, I want to make sure I get a career like that. And I've given advice periodically. And I recently was talking to uh, my friend, Dylan. He's very smart. He's uh, basically 15, lives in uh, Virginia. And he, you know, was asked me about career and whatnot. And he was asked about designing coasters. And I said, look, the thing about designing coasters is, is that there's only a handful of people on this planet at any given time that are literally designing coasters. It's, I mean, there's only, a, there's not, you know, dozens upon dozens of companies. There's, you know, a good several that are the main ones. You know, you've got Intamin, b and RMC, and you've got a few others kind of mid-tier. You've got, you know, Gerslauer and Premier, and you've got a few others, but there's, there's only a handful of companies. And each of those, it's not like they have like a giant team of designers. There's generally a couple designers at each company and that sort of thing. So the point I would make to him, and this is perhaps what you went through effectively, is, you know, there are, you know, when you're looking at maybe a couple dozen coaster designers at any given time on the planet, that's not a very common or popular job. So getting into, you know, finding a company that has an open design position is not likely versus working at a company where there's many, many companies out there that do what it is and they have many engineers or many positions in that area, um, you're more likely to find a job if there's a lot more people that are doing that at any given time. You know, for example, a software engineer, there are probably hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of software engineers on this planet that are gainfully employed and get paid quite, quite well. Lots of software development. That's a very, you know, so that's something I recommend. Um, so, you know, what you went through is, you know, you were, you thought, you know, you, you, you went to school engineering, by the way, what, what mechanical engineering, I'm guessing yep. there. Yep. Yep. I got a yeah, mechanical makes engineer. Sense. That's the smart thing to do, mechanical yep. engineering. Yeah. Yeah. So you did that and you're a smart guy and you thought, oh yeah, you know, I'm into coasters, like mechanical engineering, you're going to get a designer position. Well, it didn't happen. Again, they're not easy to come by. So the, the advice I give to people when they're when they are looking at the angle of they want to be able to have experiences and be able to travel for for work and get on coasters it's okay you don't have to be a coaster designer you don't have to work for a coaster company just find a position that involves visiting customers or you know field service or whatever it may be where you have to travel sales you know very common as well so it's, it's more about the types of roles not necessarily the company now going back to you uh you really wanted to work with coasters and so 
you know, there's designing coasters, but there's other things you can work at parks or, you know, with yourself, you have not only an engineering ability, but you have a sort of artistic maker side to you that you discovered. And here you are designing these awesome cutouts that people spend in some of them uh, hundreds of dollars for, you know, like the full train ones, which are amazing. So yeah, I mean, and you have that, you know, there's that pride too, that people are, you know, spending harder money on your products and you're making people happy and you're giving people things to display in their homes and with pride and, and their desks to work and, and all that stuff. So, you know, you found your way and, you know, even though initially it was kind of a hard to find job being a, a designer of actual coasters, you kind of found like the next best thing because you're still designing. I think I, I think I found a better thing if you personally, because I get to work with all the same parks they do. I get to design, not really working roller coasters, but I get to, I get to share in the same excitement with less liability. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause that's true. Cause you know, coaster designers, you know, if there is a major problem with a coaster, Okay, oh, yeah. granted, hopefully it's not a you know any kind of injury, but there can be liability of the part downtime or oh, God yeah. forbid, yeah, injuries and whatnot. Yeah, and it's like you know the guilt and yeah, absolutely. I mean that and that can happen to the best of designers, absolutely for sure. And that's not just coasters; that's designers of well. Cars, oh yeah, it, yeah, we deal with it every day. It's not in just industry yeah. specific. It's it's yeah. everywhere, and it's yeah. usually at least in my world, it is number one, safety is number one priority. So. Oh, absolutely. With, with cars. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. Well, you know, as I said, we'll, we'll get more into your, the maker side and what you do for work and, 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 and a little bit here, but, but yeah, I mean, obviously a major impact for you is, you know, of, of, of conquering your fears and, you know, in terms of parks having a, a positive impact to you is on your career and being able to live your passion just in a different way than what you originally thought. So that's, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So before we get to the work you do, because again, we want to talk about it more mm-hmm. in more detail. I want to ask you a few questions that are just a little more, a few kind of fun questions related to your passion for coasters. So actually, first of all, so Matt, how many coasters have you been on? Yikes. I don't keep track. I don't have a coaster count, which a lot of people roll their eyes like you don't. (laughs) But I would say um, probably like 100 to 150 different ones. Somewhere somewhere in that threshold. So I didn't roll my eyes. And and it's not necessarily just to be polite. That's part of it. But also, you know, in the interviews I've done, you know, it's not common. But you're not the first coaster enthusiast, like bona fide, you clearly coaster enthusiast um, that doesn't keep track. I mean, there are others that just don't bother, you know, don't, they don't I, bother. I think I've only kept track once. And that's what it was like a Friday night at Kings Island. I rode the vortex with my older brother 16 times and it probably caused brain injury, but we, the, <laughs> the ride off wouldn't get like, we didn't have to get up. We were in the front row. We did 16 times. And that's when I was keeping count. Cause I was like, they're not going to make us move. We're just going to keep sending it. And, and the train was like half empty too. So like every time we got back to the station, there's no one there. And we're like, we're staying on. And they're like, yeah, cool one less thing for us to pull down and push back up. So that's the only right, time I really right. counted. And it was, right. it was awesome. Career rides, right? Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. And that's something I don't do. Like there, you know, there's all kinds of statistics and kind of fun flexing, especially with social media. I've got friends that like, they keep track of every ride they go on at a park, including flat rides. And, you know, and they post it, you know, their social media at the end of the day, and they keep track of all their re-rides in history. I just keep track of Velocity Coaster, which is my number one, and only because it became my number one last year. So it is, you know, it's a recent thing. I'm like, okay, I'll start keeping track. But yeah, I mean, there's just different ways you can, at the end of the day, you know, yeah, this can be serious because sure, parks and coasters, they can be good for you, you know, again, mm-hmm. facing fears and, and I think park therapy and everything else. But at the end of the day, we're just having fun. And Absolutely. however, you know, you have fun. That's what matters. It may be different than how I have fun. It's all good. We're all here to have fun. So now do you keep track of like your top 10 coasters or like your favorites? Yeah. Yeah. Like Millennium Force is number one. Steel Vengeance okay, so is number Force two. Is number one. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. What's number two? Steel Vengeance. Steel Vengeance. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, and, then, two. Yep. and then number three would be probably Diamondback. Oh, okay. Okay. Nice. I actually just wrote Diamondback this past weekend. It's been running. Lucky. Well. 
<laughs> <laughs> so would you say there's a, a coaster that you know maybe it was really rough or there's something that you really disliked about it like your least favorite mm, least favorite uh not really i like all rides like there's a lot of hypercritical people that are like i'll never get on an slc or i'll never get on some ride because it beats the crap out of me. I'm not one of those people. I love every ride. Um, like it's a roller coaster, it's awesome. They maintain it, it's here. What's not to love? So okay. I don't have like a least favorite. I do have like a least favorite favorite flat ride. Um okay, what's that? Ocean motion because I had a bad experience at Cedar Point. Um, I didn't want to go on it. And this is like a family joke. Like I didn't want to go on it at all. I was like, I don't want to go on the boat ride. I really don't. I couldn't tell you why, but I just kept on saying, I don't want to go. My dad did one of those things where like, you're going to go um, or else who knows. We get on it. Like we sit down, the thing goes down. I was like, dude, I, I don't want to ride this thing. It's going to like totally suck. Don't want to do it. We get up there. We're full swing and it's just, it's not stopping. And I was like, oh. well, how, how long is this ride? Like, it's not ending. Turns out the, the drive tires like failed or the hydraulics failed on it. Oh. So they couldn't stop it. So we were oh, swinging wow. for 45 minutes until it, the friction just took over and stopped the swing. And I was like, I'm never going on this thing again. Oh and I don't my know if that gosh. was like a bad omen or what. But yeah, we swung there for 45 minutes. My dad was like, this is the best thing ever. You don't have to get off. And I was like, I hate this. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. That's the only bad well, experience I've ever had. You know, I, it's interesting. You made me think of actually at Cedar Point. So another kind of aspect of being a Thuzi is we, we cherish unique experiences, safe ones, Absolutely. mind you. Yes. And, and I get it. That one is a little, a little extreme, but um you know, evax, for example. Yeah. Um, one that I've never, I've had, I, I, I've had evac off of a, off of a, um, a log flume, but you know, nothing major there. But I've had some unique experiences, like relaunches on launch coasters. But you know, one things I've been curious about. I don't know if I would like it or not. And it, of course, it depends on where it happens and for to what extreme is like to be on a coaster when it valleys again safely. Mm -hmm assuming the blocks are working um i remember seeing i think it was last year gatekeeper yep. went through a valley probably from the wind or whatnot and i remember watching at least part of the video with it going back and forth and i was like i, I was thinking to myself i wonder if i would like being on that and you just made me think of that with you know with a basic pirate ship ocean motion going back and forth and i'm like yeah that probably would get to be too much and like 45 minutes that's yeah that's intense well i think I was being a little stinker about it because I didn't want to ride the ride originally. And I was also really little. I think my dad was having a blast. He was like, this is great. Like, right. He, he right. wanted to ride it anyways. So <laughs> they had a good positive attitude. That's great. Now that is not a coaster. So this, that answer does not apply to this question. So on coasters, at least, what would you say has been the craziest moment you ever had riding on a coaster? Hmm. Craziness. Um, Got an evac or something weird that happened. Um, anything weird? I think. Um, I ain't gonna have to give me a minute. Yeah, nothing. Everything's been kind of normal. Like I've like, it's probably not really weird to anyone. But uh, when I was working on the Steel Vengeance model at Cedar Point. Um, um one of the like i'd get these like passes that kind of like because i'd want to break and i'm like i'm gonna go ride a ride and and some of the people working there they're like you're not gonna go wait in line like you got work to do right so they give me like those like passes that kind of skip you to the front uh you like you go right. to exit and it's like usually you get them when you have an evac or something bad happens but you, right, they, right. They, they, this employee just wrote me a couple he's like go take a break and go ride it so my wife and i were like walking around and we're like well, what are we gonna go ride like um, and also the past didn't work for steel vengeance because it's like a new ride. And I was like, well, I'm going to go ride million force. And my wife didn't want to, she actually wanted to go ride dragster. And I was like, well, I was like, I don't like waiting in line for dragster, but I was like, if we don't have to wait in line, then let's right. do it. So we go to the exit and we give him the pass and the guy recognized me. He's like, Oh, you're the dude like making the model. Right. And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, Oh, that's so cool here. Come right here. And, and then he's like, 
point at one of the seats. I was like, can I get the front? Like, is that, is that like a big deal? Are people going to be upset? And he's like, Oh no, you can totally go, go get the front this is like <laughs> in the exit station. So, so me and my wife, we get in the front and we go up there and like, I, like I'm sure everyone knew, like I was the, the, the dude making the model. So right. um, we're like going to launch and I'm like, it'd be kind of cool if we got a rollback. Yeah, of course we did. So we got a roll back <laughs> and then we got to go again. And then the guy like, he's like, oh, did you enjoy that? And I was like, did you guys do that purpose? He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, oh, okay. First of all, like, a roll back. Did, did you like, yeah, did you set it up? Or like, I don't know how the ride actually works, but like, I feel like they knew that was going to roll back. I'm sure of it. <laughs> so first of all, a rollback totally is a very good answer for that question. Okay, even without cool. the other stuff the other stuff that's really cool and you're kind of being treated like a celebrity because they know you're working the model yeah. and then yeah that's cool too but with the idea and i guess you'll never know, never know. of whether or not they could first of all can they forcefully i i, I, don't I know. would i mean you know with an, with a lsm or l or limb base you know magnetic launch coaster i don't know if operators have access to this but i know that the manufacturers say an instrument for now modern lsm they can tune the launches they have to and that's what they do when they set them up with the parts when they're actually out there now again whether or not that's locked in or not or if that can be adjusted by the operator by the parks i, I would think maybe they could um now with a catapult launch you know the hydraulic launch like dragster I don't know if they could adjust that. Maybe, I guess maybe. I don't know. So, yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I think everyone just had their hands up that one time. Got a lot of wind drag. <laughs> <laughs> I know I did. They're like arms down. That's I'm great. like, I can't hear you. <laughs> That's great. Well, I've been on several of the catapults. I've been on Dragster multiple times, King to Ka, Accelerator. Um, not that you can really get a rollback from it, but I've been on Formula Rosa. Uh, I think maybe that's it. Storm Runner will be running here. Be finally getting on in a few weeks. But uh, I, yeah, I would love to get a rollback. Uh, I've never gotten a rollback. So that that would be pretty amazing. That That's a great answer. Now, thanks for telling us that story. Awesome. So, yeah. So, okay, let's, let's talk about the last few questions here. We're going to dig into the work that you do as a maker. So... Mm -hmm. How did you wind up getting involved with Coaster Dynamics and how long ago did you start working, you know, with them? Uh, okay. So when I got started with Coaster Dynamics, I was like smack dab in the middle of the Steel Vengeance model build. And for those that don't know, is uh, Cedar Point asked me to make a model roller coaster or a model of Steel Vengeance. It's, I think, one... Is it one twelfth or one twenty? I forget the scale. I, I don't want to say because I'm I'm gonna be wrong. Maybe okay. it's like one twentieth. It's a scaled model, and they asked me to do it. And um, there's over like two thousand three D printed parts. Every like piece of wood is hand cut, hand glued oh to match gosh. the real ride. Uh, it's based off the um, the animation. Um, images so basically they gave me everything used for the animation which does differ from the real ride but that's okay most people wouldn't know that and while i was working on that it was supposed to be an actual functioning model that people could come up hit a button and it would like actually have a train that goes around right and the entire time i was doing it the coaster dynamics guys were like oh it's not going to work for this reason it's not going to work for that reason and i was going back and forth with them because i was talking to them i think on reddit of all places and then um I forgot when at some point during that build, uh, the owner of Coast Dynamics, Jack, reached out and he said, you know, or he was asking, he's like, you know, what would you design? And he, he was actually asking me a million questions. And I thought it was so cool because like I thought Coast Dynamics was awesome and what they you yeah. know, did from the working model standpoint. And here they are noticing me trying to make a working model. Right. And uh, he asked, you know, what design software I use? And I said, oh, I use SolidWorks. And he's like, oh, we, we use that too. Would you be interested in helping us do some nanos? We have a, a lot of them coming up this winter and we, we just don't have the, the manpower, the support, the resources right. to go design all these. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like once I can take a break from this, I would love to. And because of that work, they took notice of me and my skill and talent with uh, the design you know, portion of what I was working on. And, um, I think there's actually an ACE interview with Jack and he goes into a lot of detail about this same story of how, how we hooked oh. up and he, he said the same thing. So um, yeah, they asked if I could do some nanos. I got with Dan, their engineer, and he kind of showed me how they make the nano coasters. 
And I think during my winter break, like I, um, I had to take a week off for, you know, Christmas and the new year and everything for my day job. And like I said, I, I do, uh, I work professionally eight hours of the day. And then once the evening hits, sit on my computer and do some more design work. Uh, so once, once I was off for vacation there, yeah, they gave me 16 of them to do. And they're like, yeah, I'll probably take them like a month or so. And I did them all in that break. I seriously thrashed oh, for like, wow. like burning the midnight oil. I was like, oh, dude, I was so pumped. I'm like, I'm going to make from some freaking nanos and like they're cool ones too like the very the very first nano i did was copperhead strike and um i oh, thought that okay. was that was really cool and they gave me a hard one just to like really see what i could do and i was right. like you guys right. are jerks you're giving me the hard ones i can't believe it <laughs> so um so that's so then i was like the backup nano designer and right you can't see it but like on the the wall here i have basically every nano that i did for that year oh wow um, at um because as part of the deal i was like if i design it, i want a sample of one so i was like oh, that's cool and then after i got like i think i have like 30 or 40 of them over here i'm like i'm okay you can stop sending them like i don't i don't have a place <laughs> to put all these i don't have time to build them right. all. so right. i was doing nanos and that's that's how we got started so i already had a relationship okay. with them as a as a contract worker um, prior to all the cutout stuff. So, and, and you wouldn't know that. And uh, like, I was just kind of like a ghost designer for nanos and right. um, Dan, the Dan's the engineer there. He, he would do nanos, but he also does CDX blocks. He does the Scorpion model. Right. He basically does everything and he, he gets stretched thin. So I was like the, the backup, like, Oh, you, if, if Dan can't do it, we I go see. get Matt. And, um, right. it, it, and that's kind of still how it is. I, I haven't done, many nanos recently it's like it's really dire or like we're really swamped if i have to jump right. in because now i'm doing my own product line that's also got needs and it's like well which one's gonna get you know the priority so that's what we're juggling now okay very cool very cool so before we get more into the coastal dynamic stuff i i you know and i'm doing this uh especially for some of our audience, because I know we have quite a few members of our audience where still vengeance is their number one or of course one of their favorites naturally and whatnot. Uh, I'm team Iron Quasi myself, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's all good. It's all good. So this model that you made for Cedar Point. So first of all, you were talking earlier, it sounds like it wasn't just the animation, like you were working on site and you were saying that they said, hey, take a break. So is yes. that because you would look at the actual build, you know, actually the steel vengeance itself as part of what you were doing? Um, no, 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 no. The, <laughs> so the whole model um, project was a learning experience for me because they, Cedar Point asked me to make this model, um, obviously it was 2017. So I um, was working with them to make this model. I was all supposed to be built and des or designed, built all uh, on site here in Detroit. And then I would take it to them when it was done. Oh. Um, there was a lot of, um, I, yeah, I'll just say, you know, project learning where right. I agreed and we like signed off to get it going, like signed a contract, like in October of 2017. And I was like, okay, like, do I get any engineering drawings, anything like picture, like the rides half built, like I'm getting updates, like anyone else. And I'm like, I don't even know what it really looks like and what goes where and whatnot. I was like, can you give me anything? Right. And the park said, yeah, absolutely. We'll be right on top of it. Uh, I was talking to my wife in December and I was like, dude, if, if nothing comes in on new year's, I'm out, like, I'm not going to do this. Like, there's no way like, I'm losing time. And I think it was like right. January 4th, I was like uh, checking my email and then it finally popped up. It's like, here, here's everything you wanted. And I was like, yeah, but it's been like three months. Like I could have been doing right. anything. Like I was like, you know, kind of planning out what I was like gonna do, but I couldn't actually do work. So then, so then I just started going ham, like just designing, but also juggling my real job. And right. And then so I like designed all through January, February, we started putting together the table, March, we start putting structure up and they wanted it by the end of April, like for the, the opening of the ride. And like, okay. it was like the second week in April. I'm like, dude, I don't even have half the track even laid out. Like it's not happening. 
And so right. this is the cool thing about, you know, whoever you're working with in whatever field is being transparent. And I told him, I was like, right. hey, it's not happening. I can't do it. I'm sorry. Now let's talk about options, what you want to do. And they were really good. They, Cedar Point, like they had options. They were like, okay, we could do this route, this route, this route. And they're like, well, how do you feel about working on it at the park? And I was like, you know what? This is probably a, the, it was probably the best solution. We moved the model there when the park opens. And then I basically become a living exhibit, a exhibit of a guy working on this model on the weekends. So on the weekends, every weekend that year, oh. I was down at the park, like Saturday, Sunday, sometimes Friday, and I'd be working on it. And people would come up, ask questions like, what are you doing? What are you working on? Like, how did you do different things? And I'd, I'd go up and just talk to them. Like I was basically an attraction at the park that they got for oh. free. And it, it was good because I could keep working and the pressure was off on the timeline, but there, there was so many other like factors of what was going on um, that, that caused that to happen. So it, it was actually a mistake that I was even working there at the park right um, in the museum on it I, it was never planned to be that way um so that that's that's how that happened it was just i ran out of time and because i was running out of time there was a lot of corners that were cut that shouldn't have been which i've also learned like just take your time and do everything right the first time and i knew at the time right. i was like we got to get something here like it but it wasn't done correctly let's put it that way God. Okay. Well, that's how life goes. And life is reality, not ideality. And sometimes mm -hmm. things don't go the way expect. Take things take longer. Mistakes happen. You know, whatnot. And you just have to you have to weather the storm. And it sounds like you did. Absolutely. Uh, so you just were there on the weekends at that point. So that way you could do your your job for GM, your main job during the week, mm -hmm. right? And they okay. Now, when you worked on the model, you were inside the museum at all times. Okay. Now, um, I would know this uh, because I've been to Cedar Point since Steel Vengeance opened. I've been on Steel Vengeance. But I, and you know what's funny too, because I love, yeah, I'm not big on art museums because I'm not into like art, like, you know, you know, um, modern art and things like, you know, like paintings. If it's coaster stuff, yeah, sure, <laughs> of cars or whatnot. But I love like natural history museums, science museums, and, you know, coaster museums are awesome. They're not common. You know, there's the one that ACE is working on in Texas. And then, yeah, Cedar Point has one. I've been in it years ago. And it was funny. I was with, uh, for a couple of days with some good friends of mine at Cedar Point last September. And I remember seeing the museum and I was like, oh, maybe we should go in there. And then we just go on another coaster. I didn't go in at that time. So, is the model in that museum now? No, it's not currently there. They've gutted the museum. I think they wanted to gear it more towards the park history where if you went in there previously, oh. there's all sorts of, there's like a pharmacy and then there's like park history. Oh, there's like, there's okay. no like cohesion of what the museum's about. I think I it started see. as like a frontier trail museum right. and then it got diluted and then it kind of lost its vision or mission and then they okay. closed it and they were going to renovate it but then the pandemic happened so oh. right before they started the renovation they asked if i was going to be you know helpful and move it and i was like where do you want to put it so the model right now and i believe its final resting place will be in the arcade at the front of the okay room. so was the model ever finished and on display in the museum or just it, never it was finished as a static model. It never was running full trains uh, at the capacity that we had planned it to. So it okay. was finished at, at, at a static capacity. Okay. And then it's supposedly in the arcade now, you said, in what, Frontierland or? No, it's in the arcade at the front of the park by the, oh, in the, by front of the, oh, okay. the okay. Peanuts, Peanuts Playground area. Um, oh. Or right, right oh, on the other yeah, side of where Wicked Twister is was right like near the midway yeah yes. I, I think I know what you're talking about yep. and it's it, and it's not a working model no it's it's just a static model okay so is it just it just never worked out where you get it working it, like I think I got like one or two successful laps but there's so much maintenance and he's going to train there's ah. like dust debris um, it's in a, it's in an arcade where sometimes even birds would come in and sit on it. Like you can't control wildlife, right. uh, spiders, right. like it, you think about maintenance on a real roller coaster. This thing is a roller coaster and it's in its own, you know, 
state of mind. So there was so much maintenance that had to go on. Um, the, the reliability of it was just terrible. And it was, it was, it was at random. Like sometimes it would just stop randomly and you're like, what, like what's going on. Sometimes it would make, make it through certain sections. It wasn't before it was totally random. And what it, what it boils down to, I think it was, it was a lot of, um, human error in this fact that it was all handmade. And I made a lot of mistakes along the way, which I knew oh. were going to be the mistakes. Cause I was just trying to, I was like, I need to get this done. Um, it's never going to be finished. And I put over like 5,000 man hours into it and oh, you kind wow. of reach a limit at some point where you're like, dude, this isn't going to happen. And it's funny. Cause like, it still haunts me where I'm like, I could probably get it working, but right. I, to right. what, to what end, like how much of my time, how much money, how much, and then how much would it matter? So right. it mattered to a select few people, but it served its purpose of, you know, representing the ride. And it's really cool to look at, but um, there's also a point in which you just got to, you know, say, yep, we're done here and we're moving on to bigger and better things. And right. Uh, you don't want to park get, and I, yeah, they were happy with, of where, where we left it and they were satisfied and got what they wanted out of it and we're still on good terms. So I think it was, that's good. That's overall, good. it was a, net positive experience for me because I got my foot in the door to you know work with a park and it 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 actually helped out with a lot of other things long term. So overall it was a net positive I think for both sides. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And so so it sounds like it's a lot more realistic slash complex than say like the scorpion or the dragon that absolutely Okay. That's why they were giving me all this shade. They're like, you can't make a one-to-one scale model. Like you just can't do it. You have to make your lift hill like obnoxiously taller. And then they right. say that the, the efficiency is like, thing. yeah, it's like yeah. 80%. It's it's like, yeah, gravity is the same, but your friction is totally different. And they were just you know right. all over me saying, you can't, do I'm like, I can do it. Trust me. Like I did it on these other models and it worked just fine. This was a little different. I think it was, it was strictly, a, I bit off more than I could chew. That's Got really it. What, I, I overstretched my limits. Yeah. I'm assuming you're familiar with the work of John Mendenhall, right? Uh, he, did, wait, say. He, he did the, um, with the encoder based fury design where he can control it. Oh, so realistic John, movement. yeah. Oh, I know John. Sorry. Um, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. So that is amazing what he did with that fury layout. I mean, it's not full fury, but it's, it's inspired by fear and it's, you know, it's got some of the layout, if you will, you know, but he does this thing where it's encoded. So if you can, he can control the speed of it throughout the entire track length. And that way it's realistic movement. It doesn't move like super fast, like your typical, you know, um, coaster dynamics, like a dragon or scorpion, but he's, yeah. um, he's working on, I, I, I got connected to you by Ryan Levy uh, from Instagram. So we, we, you know, we, we interviewed him a few months ago. Uh, really great you know he did that really cool static maverick design which i have i still have to build it i've been so busy it's in the case but um a really beautiful 3d printing job he did um and then you know i got connected to you and i got connected to john and so i've been following john's progress on his velocicoaster design and he's been very secretive about certain aspects of it which i get and he's not even sure if he's never gonna be able to sell it so you know i'm kind of hopeful to see that through and how that goes but anyways so going back to you know, it's really cool that you have the steel vengeance on display. I'll have to look for that next time I'm at Cedar Point. Um, but uh, you wound up, you know, obviously Coastal Dynamics took note of you and you started working with them as the kind of go slash backup cutout or as nano coaster guy. And then yep. you talked about early beginning of the interview that you had been doing 3D printing and maybe what you're referring to is the steel vengeance design, like with actual metal or, or plastic and like very expensive hundreds of dollars parts, right? And then, you know, you know, people wanted you to be able to make that for them, but they're like, it's hundreds of dollars. So then was it you that came up with, okay, maybe not a working model, but something that you could still enjoy for a much lower cost. Is that where you came up with the cutout design? Yeah. In short, that that's kind of how it all worked out. Like after Steel Vengeance, I started doing other projects. Like one of the things it's it's the scale was so small. It's like once if I did like a big one, like, like the, like the size of like, uh, like a shoe box, like the, the car, like just, okay. just blow it all up and just like, just throw as much detail in as possible because right. the larger you make it, the, the, the more you can throw in there. So I think, I think those, now that I recall, I think those are one twelfth scale and they're really large. And I did right. one for, uh, I did a Raptor train, uh, which you can, 
get the the CAD files for and 3D print yourself, and it's it's crazy big. And then um, I did a BM uh, Hyper, which I, I didn't release out so people could do it, but it was also really big. And I took it to a couple of uh, engineering trade shows and conferences. And I was actually asked to go to SolidWorks World because I designed those in SolidWorks. And it was at that uh, conference in 2020, actually. I think it was February of 2020. We were at the, the conference and I had a display in their, their main lobby, which was a full Raptor train on the track. And then at the Form Labs display, I had the Orion train. Um, and uh, oh. Form Labs is a 3D printing company, they do SLA. Um, sterile lithography, 3D printing, and all of the parts on that model were printed on my Form 2, actually, or maybe it was a Form 3. It was one of the Formlabs machines um, mm -hmm. that I printed all the parts on, and I'm a, a Formlabs ambassador for them, so I, I help showcase some of the things you can do with their, their technology and their machines. And it was at that booth that people were coming up and they're, that's where they were asking like, oh, would you ever consider selling these like parks or just people? And these are like not even coaster people. These are engineering software people. And oh. they thought it was really cool. And they were like, oh, would you ever consider selling these? I'm like, no, nah, they're too expensive. Like oh, okay. that model right there alone is $500 in material without the labor, without oh. design, without anything. It's just, just materials. And they're like, yeah. And like, they get it. They're like, okay, well, if you ever find a way to make that cheaper, like, I think you can make a lot of money. And at the same convention, I look over and there's another one of my friends that, well, I guess like we're friends now, but um, I think like that's how we all met through SolidWorks, but he had a, right. a mobile fab lab or, or um, it's a mobile makerspace or I forgot what it was called, but basically it's a trailer and inside they got 3d printers, laser cutters, oh. um, like vinyl work, like anything you'd find in a makerspace. And he was like, Oh, you should probably, like, you know, see if you can laser cut that. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you're right. Like right. I, I do a ton of things with laser cutters, but at my makerspace here in Detroit. So I legit went right back up to the hotel room um, and just started redesigning the entire like B&M hyper train as a laser cut file at the conference in the hotel room. And right. wow. on the way home, we had a concept for one and I went and I, I had, um, you know, access to a laser back home. And I cut one out. I was like, this is freaking awesome. And at the time it only cost like $2 in materials. I was like, this is, right. this is, this is wood, right? Exactly. Right. right. So I, I went and found a used laser on Craigslist or Facebook marketplace that didn't work. I gutted the whole thing, rewired the whole thing. Um, because like I couldn't afford a brand new laser. They usually go like 18,000 for like the good ones. Wow. I, I bought a junk, a junky one that didn't work and, and re rewired the whole thing. So then I had a laser at my house, started prototype place things. And I showed the coaster dynamics guys and they were interested, but they were like, well, at the time you had to glue the cutouts. Like you had to actually glue it all together. Oh. We didn't have the tabs. And, and Jack said, okay, if you get rid of the glue, if you can make it like, it's just snap together. Like I'm in, we'll, we'll go and market this. So I set up an Etsy where you could get like generic cars. Like I had a PTC, a hyper, um, an arrow corkscrew style train, and you had to glue it all together. And those are like the right. OG original coaster cutouts that only a, like a few people have because I sold them on Etsy and uh, went back, redesigned all of them to have interlocking tabs that snapped together and showed it to Coaster Dynamics and uh, they loved it. And it was funny because the, the the first ride I did with the tabs was Millennium Force. And it's like, well, duh, I love that ride. So, <laughs> so obviously we go to Cedar Point with a cutout of Millennium Force and Steel Vengeance. And those were the first two commercially available uh, cutouts um, that we ever did. And it was at Cedar Point. Oh, okay. And it was great because like I already had connections there. Coaster Dynamics did. And I wanted to do rides that I had sentimental ties to. So obviously it's Millennium Force and Steel Vengeance. So that's Very how it cool. got started. That's how the start. Yeah, right. Wow. The rest is history, but we'll, we'll get some more of that in a moment. But so at CoasterCon this year, Ace CoasterCon, which was one of the parks was at Cedar Point. Yes. Uh, I was not there, but, you know, you know, I was certainly following it and friends were posting things. And one of the things that came up that was one of the surprises was the Coaster Dynamics, and I didn't even know they had these, because this made, yeah, like a lot of enthusiasts, I've kind of come in and out of the hobby as, you know, being married and college and stuff. And I guess I wasn't aware of this back when these came out, but these like molded plastic trains that are, that are the statics. Yeah. The statics, yeah. 
So were you involved in those two? No, like these guys, yeah, this is all Mike Graham. This is Mike Graham and Jack. Okay. And, and is, these, that predates you then, right? Yes, that is correct. Got it. Got it. Okay. So they are very cool too, in their own way. Yeah. So, okay. So in your opinion, what is better about the, the cutouts than those? Um, there's a bunch of things. They're bigger. The bigger, statics are right. actually pretty small. The, right. And um, I think they're, I think the cutouts are cheaper. Uh, you, right. can, you can paint them and color them yourself. So if you have like Millennium Force, you can paint a yellow, or red, or blue one. Um, I'm biased. So of course my answer is going to be <laughs> one way. They're both um, cool. They're both they cool. are both yeah. really cool. Obviously I have one myself. I actually bought that when they were originally out because I thought they were so cool. But there is yeah. differences. I think I think there's more. It, it, so Coaster Dynamics is a business. They need to operate like a business. Everyone thinks that they can do whatever they want, no. and yeah, they right. need to do where the they need to you know design and manufacture products where the money is. They need to make money. They're a business. Otherwise, they go out of business, and then you have nothing. So right. with that said, to make the statics, they have to get molds made, uh, like tooling done with right. the cutouts all you need is a laser and a guy like me to design it and we can make it, you know, we can get the wood to be as close as possible, even put more detail sometimes in the statics that sometimes lack right. detail because you need to make it, uh, you know, for the die draw of the tooling. So there's right. limits to both. And right. there's, I think they're two separately independent products of themselves I think you'll see more cutouts only because to make a statics, you need to do so much more initial investment that you might not get back in the long term. So, right, because the tooling, for example, right, exactly, right. which is just thousands right. and thousands of dollars to mass, well, not even mass produce. They're just they're doing short runs on those, so right, it's really right. tough to make money off them, and they they probably won't make that much money off of them until they get more popular, but. Like there's, there's limits there. It's hard. It's really tough. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks for explaining that. Cause as someone that's not a maker and, and understands the stuff just in the periphery, didn't quite get that. So now I'm also go make the assumption, but I'm going to ask to, to clarify, you know, so we don't assume things in general that the cutouts are not painted from the factory just for, for cost reasons. Right. Um, that's a reason it's not the reason. So yeah, it, it, we, we do paint them. So certain models um, that are, I guess, special edition or limited edition, we will paint. We have a Millennium Force lift hill that's painted. We have. So did you do that, by the way, that one just came out last year? Was that you? Uh, the lift hill or? The big lift hill. Was that you that came up with that design? Yeah. Yeah. So the, there's 310 of them out in the wild. Right. And right. Um, yeah, we did, or I did that because the park said we need something for Millennium Force. I'm like, I'm making this freaking lift hill. And they're like, you can do it. And we're like, yeah. And they're like, yep, go for it. Like <laughs> Cedar Point's the best because they'll just give us free reign. They'll be like, what do you think right. is cool? They, they, they come up with a lot of ideas themselves, which actually half of them were like, I don't think we can do that. Cause they're dreamers too. And it's like, right. you gotta reel them in, but they're like, I think it was pretty much like, what can we do with Millennium Force? That'd be cool. I'm like the lift hill. And they're like, go for it. So yeah, we did that. And that one's painted. So it, there's, there's the, the blue, the green for the grass, the, the gray for the station, the supports. Um, so we do do that. It, it's more cost, it's more work, um, but right. it's not it's not a deal breaker. Like we, we can do that, no problem. Um, gotcha. And then at Kings Island, they did a special edition Eiffel Tower and that was painted the exact same color as the tower, which I thought was pretty cool. That is and cool. There is another model that will come out probably by the time this episode airs that has color. And it's like, I'm so stoked for, so we, we can do color. We do do color. I personally would not like to do color only because I like to see what other people do when they paint them. And right. sometimes different trains have different color schemes depending on the train. So right. I, I don't right. want to limit ourselves. Right. And then I also don't want to make it expected that they're all going to have color because right. um, we already have some, like all of the pre-existing ones don't now gotcha. if you look at history the nano coaster started in just sheet metal and they didn't have color when they started right and now they do so maybe if you know we stall and we need something we need something to freshen up the brand we'll start painting them all or we'll start doing some you know inf or um 
you know, the, the, the printing where you actually print like the details on the sides. But then the other problem with that is you have to, you to do both sides and there's manufacturing issues with that. It's just easier to paint it. But we, we right. have explored it and we, we do do it. So it, it is an option and we'll, we'll just see. We'll just see what happens. We'll see where this goes. Gotcha. Uh, so I'm curious about the painting part. Obviously, I could, I'm talented enough. I could paint things, but it's just time and I'm not maybe the best painter, but I, I will share with you. Do you know um, uh, the YouTube channel, El Toro Ryan? Yeah. You follow that. So um, I'm friends with several of the guys from that channel. Uh, the first of one, first of which I met, is a friend of mine here down here in Florida, which is very close by, uh, Mark Martinez from El Toro Ryan. I don't know if you know Mark at all. Or I don't know him videos. personally, but I've seen the videos, yeah. Yeah, so he, he's a character, first of all. Um, I would like to have him on the podcast one day, but I need to keep his attention focused, which that's a whole other challenge. But anyways, um, he's, he's a good friend. He's a funny guy, really nice guy. Um, he's very coaster focused. He's, he's coasters are his thing. And the pandemic, of course, even here in Florida, in the beginning, you know, there, we, none of us had much of anything to do, even coaster stuff, even here in Florida. So, uh, I was over at his, uh, at, at his place, um, maybe right as the parks were reopening, like May, June of 2020. And I saw something because Mark, he, by the way, he's keeping you in business. He's one of these guys. Iron Guazi, he bought the full train. I think oh, Anthony yeah. did the same thing. He he buys all the stuff. He's he's always buying it. So he's a really big collector of your of your work. Anyway, so I was over at his place and I noticed something very striking on the coffee table. I'm like, Mark or Austin, Austin's his roommate. And I was like, Where did you get that? Where did you get that? And it's one of my favorite coasters of all time, Volcano. You know, <laughs> going up the up, you know, twisting around the you know the the track yep. uh, for the launch. And, um, and it was painted and I was like, this looks amazing. I didn't even, I didn't see it as a cutout. It didn't even look like a cutout to me because he, Mark, while the parks were closed, because mm -hmm. I asked him what, what was going on here. And he said, yeah, it's a coaster dynamics. I painted it. You know, I didn't have anything else to do. And he did an amazing job, like so detailed. And so that's why I was asking about you guys painting from the factory because the, the, your cutouts are awesome. They're really cool. Thank but you. like painted for me personally, they're like that's next level. That painted, that's the thing. they look almost real. Like I'm telling you, yeah. like I try to jam pack as much detail as possible. And then the fact that it's made out of wood, like you kind of like think yeah. abstractly and how do I make it look like the real thing, even though it's like boxy and blocky and right. you really do so right. much. But I'm telling you, when you paint them, some of them look like the real like you just move you're like that's like the real thing. Some of them come out really good. Um and, and that's the other thing too. It's like, I, that's why I'm like, I kind of don't want to paint it. People out there are way more talented than us and they'll paint it and make it look way better than we could ever make it. So why, why limit us to, to that when you have talented people? Yeah. And let them, let their passion fly themselves. Exactly. Have fun with it. It's a craft really. It is. It really is. And you know, I'd, I'd love to see, and I could see, um, Actually, one of my friends, not Mark, another one who's like Iron Guazi is his number one. He's obsessed with it. My friend Kalen, and I could see him painting the full train. And that that could because that train is amazing. Iron Guazi's train is beautiful. I've seen a few and, painted trains and and the amount of just dedication and time, like I can't imagine. Like it must be hours just painting, but it makes me so happy to see people enjoy them because I put a lot of effort into it. Like I don't just like sit and go through the motions. Like I try to capture every detail that I possibly can um, and make sure I try not to miss anything. So, but there is, there is a, occasional slips where it's like, Oh, what the heck was I thinking? But that's everyone's human. There's, there's always mistakes. <laughs> so uh, speaking of the models getting painted and an example of where it is offered you know, by default from the factory, if you will, painted. Mm -hmm. uh, and one that I own, and it's my favorite coaster, Velocicoaster. coaster. It's got the blue stripe. So tell me, how did that come to be? Um, so the acrylic, right? That, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, or, or like this front part. Yep, there it is. Yep. yep. So cool. Yep. So, so I, it's always a story, but I'll give you a quick one. I, I don't know um, where in the world this idea came up, 
but I was designing it and um, it was all wood. And I had the whole train. I actually, we, we made a portfolio for universal because we were, um, what is it? You know, you're, you're um, pitching them. You were pitching them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was like, you know, we're trying to conquest more, more parks and try to get, get in their realm. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and so I made a portfolio of, of offerings. And in that the Velocicoaster um, had a wooden front grill where the lights was and, and Jack at Coaster Dynamics, he's like, you know, like this is great and all, but like the real ride lights up and everything. What's well, if we put like a, an acrylic there and have it be different and have it really pop. Like, just like, right. we're not going to put lights in it, but if you make it acrylic, people could put a little like LED in there or light it themselves. People will get creative. Like, why, why don't we just do that? And remember, this is Coaster Dynamics. They deal with acrylic daily with the nano coasters because the bases are all acrylic. So it's nothing new to them. And so it was his idea. And I was like, yeah, well, why not? Like, if you're okay dealing with the complexity of cutting wood and acrylic, let's go for it. And, um, I think Universal was just like they saw it and were like, yes, we have to have that. Nice. Um, so it was definitely Jack from Coaster Dynamics. It was his idea and I love it. Like I think it was awesome. And when we can incorporate stuff like that, we do go for it. We don't limit ourselves to just wood, although um I think there's a there's a delicate balance of you know what, what we should, you know, venture off into. But I think it was it was a great idea and it was totally his. Very cool. Very cool. And I, I mean, I don't have the sales numbers, obviously, but I'm Universal Orlando. I live five minutes from there. It's my home park. And there are a lot. And it sure seems like they've sold a fair, a fair number of those. It's been successful. So it, yes, yeah. it is. It has been and they're happy. And we are diligently working with them to do more cool things. The, mm -hmm. uh, the, the only, um, the only reason why we only have that one and like there's there's a lot more behind the scenes that really go on with with those because there's licensing branding we got to make oh, sure of course we get product testing um they're very for good reasons they're very critical about all the you know requirements and criteria that we have to meet so it, that takes time and it has to go sure. through the levels of approval where some of the right. smaller regional parks they don't have that you know level of uh, complexity that we have to go through but like we we do what they say and th like uh, it's it's a you know there's there's it's a partnership that you know there's a road you gotta go both ways and you know oh, of course we we do everything they ask of us and it's just slow sometimes so there's right. a lot there's stuff in the pipeline that's coming down that's gonna be awesome can't talk about it but um, hope to be hope to be doing more stuff with them it's really exciting. well exciting I, I look forward to seeing more of your work and you know dynamics there at universal that's awesome that's uh their uh, islands adventure is my number one park in the world that i've been to at least thus far so and they I, i'm there all the time i love the last coastal of haggard so look forward to seeing what else you guys do that's awesome so uh speaking of favorites like lost coast would be my favorite so what would you say is the favorite project that you've done for coaster dynamics oh i feel like how Definitely the lift hill, like well, yeah, like, yeah. that was just like a no brainer. They're like, we're gonna do Million Force lift hill. It's like just go go crazy with it. And I did, and like I was working probably way too hard on that to make it perfect. Um, another fun one. Um, as I look around the room here, <laughs> I I do like I, I like the um, the first train we did with the. Um, what's it called uh, dueling dragons that was a fun one because there's just oh, so much theming of the dragon on the ride um, right that was a lot of fun and that was just kind of something we did with you know we didn't really we're not working with the park on that because it's a, a ride that's gone but yeah. that was a lot of fun to do that one i i like i like to do engaging projects with them that there's a lot of back and forth and um there's a lot of ideas going around um it just it gets annoying when like you do like you throw out a proposal and they're like okay that's great let's like nix all of it that that guy that kind of gets annoying but um no it, it, i'd say the lift hill is like nuts and then any of the the, the full size trains x2 is another one when oh we, yeah when we got the green light to do x2 like i was like in heaven because i was like we're gonna make this thing awesome and and for example like when six flags asked for us to x2 um 
I think Jack was asking, he's like, he's like, what are you going to do about the seats? I'm like, what do you mean? What are we going to do? Like, they're going to rotate just like the real thing. He's like, well, they don't, they don't need that. They don't, they're not asking for the seats to rotate. I'm like, that's nice. I'm going to make it rotate like the real one. <laughs> and then, so you get, there's a rack and pinion in there and it actually rotates. And they thought it, like it blew everyone away. I'm like, why is this blowing you away? Like the real ride does it. The coast, the cutout needs to do it too. It needs right. to be like the real ride. So I like, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't realize that you had done an X2 and an X2 and X because I wrote a season pass previews back in early 2002. I was one of the first with the original Arrow Trains. It was amazing even back then. Um, it was my favorite. It was my number one coaster for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I didn't realize I was looking through some of your stuff on Instagram recently. I'm like, oh, he did an X2. Oh, wow. So is that sold at Magic Mountain? Yeah, it, it, I, it, it might be online. I don't know. Like the online stuff's kind of weird because I, I I don't follow and don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's, not, you know, it's definitely still at the park. We have a full train and the, the single car. So yeah. I'll have to look for that because I might need to get that for myself. But very I cool. heard yeah, they that... might be sold out at the moment. Uh, I don't know. Okay. But don't, don't trust me because I only get like secondhand knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I know. I believe it never hurts to ask, never hurts to look and try, and you know, Absolutely. the worst of things doesn't happen. But uh, yeah, I mean, and yeah, I'm going to be at Magic Mountain probably this fall to ride Wonder Woman, and I'll have to look if I don't find it before then. But no, thanks. Look, and that does look awesome, and the pictures look amazing. So, thanks. yeah, for sure, for sure. So now you are the interview. You're at home right now, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so you I, you have cutouts behind you. Of course, this is a podcast. I can't see, but I can see. Yeah, we're talking probably, here, we'll, we'll just do this because you shouldn't see. Oh, wow, you got a car, like a car. Oh, car you shouldn't see actually any of these. <laughs> this, oh, is bad, oh, this is bad oh, stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Right, well, You're fine. Yeah, no, we're not releasing the video like we talked about. Don't worry. So I'll have to, I'll have to bleach my eyes. But Everyone's um, like, why don't you have a video now? <laughs> <laughs> so... You, do you, I'm assuming you have like multiple three printers, a laser, your laser cutter. You talked about you all that all at home. Yeah, I basically right? have like a maker space at my home. It's so, crazy. are you just prototyping like for Ghost of Dynamics? Like yeah. you release the design to them, and they do it with, with their equipment. Yep, so, yep. So they do all the mass production. I do the prototyping. I have three lasers here. I have like a small, a medium, and a large one, all for different reasons. Um, and so I'll do the prototyping and do the initial builds just to make sure it works. Then I send the files to Coaster Dynamics. So they're they're in Virginia, which is great because I can work here and not have to worry about being on site there. Right. And then they'll go, they'll go build a version of it. And then if they're happy and satisfied with it, they'll take pictures. And then we use that to make the boxes and then sell it to the park or like show it. Like when I say sell, I mean, show it to the park and say, hey, this is our proposal. What do you think? And then they can kind of go back and forth. And then once we get the green light, um, Coaster Dynamics does all the mass production on site in Virginia. Oh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. So, so speaking of things that you've built yourself, so moving away from Coaster Dynamics, I want to talk to you about one more. This is one more question here before we finish up. Mm-hmm. Uh, one more project that you worked on because I, I I guess I saw it when I first was connected to you by by Ryan. I was like, oh, not a favorite coaster, but very unique coaster in real life and design and and just look really cool as a model that you built a working model. So let's talk about Invertigo. Oh yes. So yes. Oh yes. I love I love how you're excited to talk about this. It's awesome. Okay. So how long ago did you do Invertigo? Holy moly! I think that was 2017 right or 16 okay. so oh no i started in 2016 i think i finished it in 2017 because right yeah right when in that finished or right when i got it working um consistent consistently that's when i got hooked up with cedar point and steel vengeance so yeah it was like 2017 oh, okay. got it yeah you definitely started getting a lot busier at that point as yeah. we've already talked about right okay so was that just a fun project just for yourself Yep. Yeah. So I was just doing it in my spare time. It really wasn't a deadline. The idea was just to see if I could 3D print a working model. And what I learned there is um, you can definitely do it. There's like certain aspects that you have to like play around with. But I, I only picked that ride because I wanted it to be something I've ridden and also have a small footprint so I can make it really large, but also not take up a lot of space. So the scale was so big that I could fit on a, like a full sheet of plywood. So it was eight feet by four feet. 
Uh, right. so it, was, it was still a big model and you can't really get like if you have a normal door you can't get it through it like you have to get like double right. doors to even move it or a garage door so it was still Got pretty that. large and uh yeah. th that's the main reason because if i did it at that same scale for any other ride this thing's going right. 20 30 40 feet right so. yeah i think the only kind of coasters you can do that with like a schwartz car shuttle and vertigo or a boomerang yep. or you know a gib um, yeah, Gib would be really interesting because that is an Invertigo, but like a, a better, you know, a more advanced yeah. version of it, or I guess a Skyrocket 2 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So now the boomerangs are famous or infamous in real life. And I had this happen to me. Luckily, it, it happened after the retrofits. Um, I was riding uh, the boomerang at Discovery Kingdom in 2017. One of the boomerangs that actually had the problem back in the day, back in like 99, where it would not catch on the second lift hill and then it wouldn't have the additional potential energy and it would get, it would valley. And yep. unfortunately, they would oftentimes valley in the cobra roll, which is a very bad place to get people stuck. Um, so when it happened to me, um, <laughs> it was very funny. Uh, it's a real quick, I was with a couple of friends that had never been on a boomerang before. And I was telling them about this problem and they're both engineers. And they were laughing about it. We all worked for a, a scientific company. We're joking, oh, it'd be, you know, that way it, way it works, it sounds like it was made by our company. I'm making fun of our company. <laughs> um, and then we go on it later that day. And of course it happened. So one of my friends went on Facebook Live and we were just all joking about it. Luckily, again, it had been retrofitted and the brakes are, uh, apply, the emergency brakes apply for the loop so that we don't get stuck upside down. And we and we wound up getting evac. That's actually, I did, I've gotten evac off a coaster. That's right. Anyway. So, you know, was it a challenge for you with Invertigo to, to build that, that system where that second lift hill, if you will, catches yeah. the train reliably and, and all that? Oh, absolutely. It was, it was a total pain in the butt. And that's where <laughs> I made a mistake because I was like, oh, I'm going to pick this easy one. Like it's going to have a short layout. We'll just test the uh, 3D printing aspect. And I was like, oh, if I want to make it work, I got to make these lift hills work. And it was a disaster. Right. Because uh, I went down the approach of like, we'll use magnets. And then the problem is to keep your inertia or the momentum of the train, you need to make it really heavy. So if you have a really heavy train, you have powerful magnets, which I can uh, fit because there was enough space. And it was just snowballing of issues. But I was able to figure it out after, you know, several redesigns and revisions and playing around with the, the train and the, the mechanism and everything. And I actually had three different setups to make it work. I even had one version that worked like the real thing where like the, the, the chain would actually move up and down inside the track. And like, it was really elaborate, but um, wow. that, that it didn't work as well as, just, you know, dialing in the, the magnets. And um, there's a couple of YouTube videos on online. If, if you're interested to, to watch, I go like really in depth on like the functionality of it. And it was, wow. It was, it was a lot of, there was a lot of learning in there and a lot of the electrical and programming side to make, make sure it all worked correctly. Like it really did run like a real roller coaster. Like the restraints would go up and down, the floor would drop, the gates would open, all the lift hills would work just fine. Like I wanted to pack as much detail as possible, which is really hard sometimes. Um, so, but it, it looked really cool. So it was a total right. pain. And I do, I like at the time I was like, oh, I regret doing this. I should have picked something easier. Like just like lifted it to the top and let it go. But, uh, but it was all to scale and it all went through the circuit perfectly. So it, it was a big victory for me when that finally worked. Very cool. Does it still work today? Like have you tried uh, it? No, it's packed away. <laughs> it doesn't know it, it, it served its purpose. Um, right. I, it's kind of in pieces, actually. If if you want the honest, uh, oh okay, okay answer. Gotcha. So it's, yeah, it's in pieces in the garage. Yeah, the moment, no, so. this. I mean, I'm I I work with you know I I love Legos. I still build them now. I built them as a kid, and but like the working models are like the ultimate for me. And yeah. I have I have God. Some of the enthusiasts that are listening right now, they're going to be like have daggers out for me. I have in a, so last year, um, twenty twenty one. Coaster Dynamics, they announced that they're going to, I don't know how many, 500, whatever it was, make more Dragon Kits. 
And I bought one and it's sitting in a box. It's ready to be built. I just don't have time. That's where the dad just come out. Um, it's like, how could you not build it? You had to be building it the first day. You got, uh, anyway, I have something to look forward to. And then I just ordered, I, I'm more about like having it so, so I can like it, so I don't miss out. And so I can yeah. build it when I have time. So I just ordered the Lego loop coaster, which I'm excited to build. But the ultimate for me would be we'd build a working velocity coaster model, which is why I'm very curious to see where John goes with his. But anyways, but uh, these, you know, you guys are just, I mean, when I see you guys, I mean, you, I would call you guys like the extreme makers in the community. Like you're not just, you know, a little fabbing little wood, you know, you guys are doing like, you can do working models. You can do like, you know, ultra detail and, you know, just amazing things with 3D printers and laser cutters and all that and like people like you and John I just I'm in awe of and now they, you know, people like John is another guy where they're doing LSMs on onto scale and it's just I mean it's amazing just you know being into science and engineering to STEM just to see this stuff where the parks spend hundreds of millions of dollars and then you're doing it to smaller scale which helps reduce the cost but still it's like amazing I just am in awe so. Oh, yeah, no, it's awesome. No, John's very talented. He he's uh definitely got a bright future for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know some of the things he's doing, you know, obviously like you did, you know, to get noticed and he, he like he definitely has a bright future. He's uh, he's gonna do amazing work at I think a larger scale eventually in life. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. So well, you know, thank you for uh it's been quite a journey, been fun talking about, of course, you know, your interest in coasters in general, your work at coaster dynamics and some of the personal work you did fascinating the steel vengeance and definitely telling some friends i did not know you did steel vengeance model and that it's it's on display i've got some crazy rmc fans that um that they're gonna like oh some of them probably don't even know that it exists <laughs> but uh well it's been a great conversation so last thing i want to ask you um here matt is uh you know obviously here in the podcast, one of the things we can't do is, you know, show videos, show pictures. So that's where Instagram and other sites come in. So if you want to share any social media, um, you know, remind people where they can get, you know, Coaster Dynamics' website, you know, how they can find the products that you create for them, uh, just share away. Yeah, absolutely. So you can follow, the best place to follow me is on Instagram, which it's Print My Ride Detroit. Um, the second best place, I guess, is YouTube. I, I have been kind of flaky. It's really hard to sit down and spend time making videos because I like to sh go into the nerdy aspect of design and engineering of like how I could make models using like no limits, for example, or just CAD software for so SolidWorks. So that's also Prim My Ride Detroit and you can check out on YouTube. And then for like coaster models, like the cutouts, definitely coasterdynamics.com. And on their website, you can go and find um, the, the cutout section and all the different um, unbranded cutouts that they offer. And then also if, if you're looking um, for cutouts, definitely check your, your, your favorite theme park um, merchandise website. They, they, you know, we're, we're slowly growing. I can't like imagine um, most of the main parks that people venture to don't have them. Um, like where, where it's all the Six Flags, Cedar Fair parks, Universal, Holiday World, um, like Sea World, uh, Bush Gardens, like we have cutouts like all around. We're, we're slowly growing. Um, so check there too. Like, um, and then the, the more cutouts you produce, the more we'll make. So um, that that's kind of where you can find me. Yeah. Awesome. Instagram is the best place. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I know you have some great stuff on Instagram. Great, great uh, content, you know, great to see the work you've done. And again, both for Coastal Dynamics and just, you know, on the personal level, it's amazing. So thank you again. Well, thanks again for taking the time to talk with us and uh, keep on making because you do great work. Thank you. Will do. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to see more of us, we upload every Friday. And check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all at Coaster Challenge. Links are in the description below. Thanks for joining us here today.